world this morning, I want to go ahead and just hop on up in the word, if that is okay. So if you can stand to your feet, our friend, the Apostle Paul is going to be helping us today from the text Colossians 3, and we're going to read from 1 to 12, and it's from the NLT version. I'm going to start, you all will come in, and then I'm going to move out the way, and then y'all will finish up, all right? Bless you. All right, Colossians 3, 1 through 12. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ... Amen. I'm going to go back to verse 10, and I'll read that one. It says, put on your new nature, everyone say new, New. and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Father God, we thank you for this moment, Lord Jesus. God, we thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for your resurrection power that comes through Christ. Help those who don't know or believe in you, Lord God, on today. Help us to surrender our belief. Help us to come to know you as the Messiah, Lord, over our lives. God, help us to set our hearts and our minds on you, Lord. Let all other names fade away in the distance as you take your place on the throne of our hearts. Today, God, I ask that you open our ears, our eyes to better understand our fallen nature and emphasize our need for a savior. Help us to recognize that our weaknesses are made strong in you, for you are the source of our strength. You are the source of our life. And we declare right now that we will give it all over to you. And it's my prayer that today you teach us, Lord, what it looks like to be an image bearer of the Father, living a holy and acceptable life unto you. Hide me behind your cross, Lord God. Let all other things, Lord God, melt away right now, Lord. Let you be known in this moment. Let you be glorified in this teaching. Speak to us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. When you take your seat, look at your neighbor and say, victory looks good on you. Look at that same neighbor and say, don't I know it? (laughs) So my title and focus today is Holiness Lived, and we're going to be emphasizing the victory over sin. Someone say victory. Victory. So if you are joining us for the first time, um, we've been going through a sermon series called Set Apart and really emphasizing one of the mighty attributes of God, which is God's holiness. 
And if you have journeyed through us, hopefully you've already caught on that God has a plan for believers to be set apart and to be holy. Our Heavenly Father has a divine intention for holiness in the lives of those that have been chosen to pursue Christ. Everyone got that? Okay. So this idea that humans were created to be holy is rooted all throughout scripture. And so, for example, in Leviticus, it says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. In Ephesians, it says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. First Peter says, but just as he who, who called you is holy, be holy in all that you do. Hebrew says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone to be holy. And so we're not just going through the sermon series or telling you all to be holy. It's in the word. It's in the Bible. And so as believers, we are called to reflect God's holiness in our actions, um, in our relationships, in our thoughts, in our decisions. And so this call is a fundamental part of Christian life. And I would assume that many of us desire to pursue this. We desire to be moral. We desire to live righteously. We desire to have holy living. But there are times where we fall short. And hopefully I'm not alone in that, that we have all fallen short. And so when our human being partners with our spiritual being, there's this struggle that happens. And it's a fact that once we enter into Christhood, that we're all going to have this struggle, that we're all going to have this this battle between right and wrong. Um, There's this tension between our sanctification and our sin, our human nature and our spiritual nature. And so I often think of like this as the battle between good and evil. And I love cinema. And so I often get my metaphors from movies. Um, So if you're thinking about this good and evil, it's usually depicted um, as there's a hero and then there's a villain. And so you have the Avengers, sorry, DC people, um, versus (laughs) Thanos. (laughs) You have Harry Potter versus Lord Voldemort. You have Batman versus the Joker. You have iPhone versus Android, whichever one you want to do there. And so you have God and our adversary, Satan, right? And so we understand that there's this war going on. And, and, and from um, even in like cartoons, you'll see the angel on one shoulder and then you'll have the, the devil depicted on the other shoulder, right? And so there's this macro view that we have of good and evil. Um, but when it comes to sin, it's more of an internal battle. It's not just happening around us, it's happening in us. And so Paul even said it best in Romans. He says, um, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I just keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's the sin that is living in me that does. And Paul was a Christian writing this. And so he knew the internal struggle and that tension that we have as believers. Paul's words reflect this earnest desire to, um, to please God, right? But however, despite our best intentions, we find ourselves stumbling. We find ourselves um, trying to pursue righteousness, pursue holiness, but we often find ourselves falling, falling short. And we are, if you look around, we are all in that right now. Um, There is no one that has not sinned, right? Um, I even think of back before you were saved. And so BC, before Christ, think back. Some of you might have to think a long, long way back. Um, But before that, there you know, the struggle of holy versus non-holy, that for me at least, it wasn't really a thing. There wasn't, when I was living in sin, it 
there wasn't this battle. There wasn't this tension. I was out here in these streets, you know? Um, I won't think about living holy, right? And so there wasn't any um, struggle that was going on internally. Um, the enemy is not going to fight against or attack something that he already has control over. And so when we're living in sin, we're not going to feel that tension. But now as believers, we have the Holy Spirit living within us, right? And so the Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit is what brings that awareness and that need for transformation because without it we're just out here yellow right just living a life <laughs> um and my hope for today is to kind of get us to think about um what it really looks like to live and pursue holiness even with this internal struggle um that we find ourselves in I know when I think about my Christian journey, a lot of us might think about our um, testimony when we were saved. Um, mine is really boring, so I don't often think about it. But I do think about the conversion moments that I have, the conversion moments, the moments where something would happen that I experience, and it's like I'm um, growing deeper in the Lord or this quick switch where I know that I'm growing spiritually with the Lord. Um, I often think about, about those times and. As I was preparing for this, God brought up a memory, y'all. So I'm going to go ahead and be transparent with that. Um, I was like, you sure want me to share that? He was like, yes. So um, years and years ago, you know, started walking with the Lord. Um, and I um, had, you know, given my life over to the Lord. I've been saved at this point. Um, in Christian community, I, you know, stop cussing, stop listening to certain music, you know, doing the thing. Um, and at the time, I was a part of a Kojic church, Church in God in Christ, Pentecostal church. They would be proud of what I'm wearing right now. <laughs> I forgot my stockings, though, y'all. I forgot my legs a little out. <laughs> but my ankles covered, okay? Um, literally. <laughs> Um, and so we had um, a song in the choir in this church, and um, we had an evening event that we were going to sing at. And so, you know, the evening is at 7 o'clock, and so I got time to just do whatever I want the whole day. And so I decided to chill with someone. And back then, it wasn't really Netflix and chill, okay? It was just chill, okay? <laughs> just chill. We ain't got time to watch TV, just chill. Um, and so, yes, and so I, I fell into um, this temptation and then went to church, y'all, right after. Who does that? Went to church. Yep. <laughs> went to church right after. Um, and as I'm singing, you know, just all of a sudden, like, I just broke. And as you're, when you're singing and you're worshiping um, on stage, Brittany, you can attest to this and Jeremy, you know, it's okay to show emotion. It's okay to cry, but when you can't get the words out, it's, it's, it's a different thing. It's like a same cry sob, you know, it's just different. And so literally, I'm breaking on stage, unable to sing, and um, my heart is just like filled with recognizing God's heart. And so the Holy Spirit was able to put that weight on me, and it wasn't that God was angry with me. Um, it wasn't a hard feeling, but the Holy Spirit was like, God right now feels rejected. He feels abandoned. He feels, he's sad at the decision that I made. Um, and I call that a conversion moment because it was probably the first time that I actually felt the total weight of my sin and the weight of God's heart within that. Um, and so I decided to not live that lifestyle, not do those activities anymore. Um, and I'm grateful for that, for that moment. Um, but then I'm thinking, man, that happens all the time where we are trying to pursue God and temptation comes up and we give into temptation. And I think at sometimes we can feel, man, am I really a Christian? Do I really love God? You know, I went to church. 10 minutes later, you know? And so you have that doubt and, and that, that guilt that comes up with that. And so the question is like, why? Why do I know the Bible? Why do I know what God expects of me? 
Why do I, you know, I know the truth, yet my actions don't reflect that. Someone say, why? So glad you asked. <laughs> so there are different like behavioral things that, you know, we can all come up with, you know, um, you know, our trauma impacts our decision making. Unhealthy coping skills impacts our decision making. We have, um, you know, this learned behavior as a child that impacts our decision making. We might just be apathetic. You know, we might want to avoid things. There's all these things that happen. Even through this sermon series, um, the core uh, part that I think Amir pre strong was just unbelief. Like we don't believe God can give us the desires or needs or pleasures. And so we go to other things for that and we end up in sin. Um, and then there's self-striving where and then this is something that I had to repent of in my early stages of becoming a Christian. It's like, God, I got this. I can live this for you. I can do these things for you. But it was all by my might. I was not leaning on the Lord to help me be with him. I was not leaning on the Lord. It was my own personal efforts. And that is what that self-striving does, is that human tendency to solely rely on ourselves and not God. And so all these things go into our decision making, the addictions that we have, you know, that goes into our decision making where it makes it hard to pursue holiness and righteousness. But don't we know that we have a savior family that came, he wrapped himself in flesh and he came to die for our sins. And so we don't have to live in sin anymore. We don't have to live this lifestyle. We don't have to allow our, our setbacks or uh, our setbacks to keep us stuck that we can move forward. There is hope. And, and there's that shame and that guilt that can come at times when we make mistakes and when we fall. And a lot of us will stay there will stay stuck in that guilt and that shame. It will prevent us from confessing. It will prevent us from repenting. It will uh, prevent us from coming back to church. You know, what if Ashley back then just didn't go to church anymore? What if I stayed stuck in that, in that shame that I felt? But that is not what the Lord wants for us. He wants us to continually pursue him and know that there is grace. Someone say grace. We have grace. And so when we fall, when we struggle, we have grace. And that is the message, the core of today is that we need to take heart and to know that there is true freedom and redemption and redemption. And we need to operate family from a position of victory. And Paul exposes this struggle very well in many of his letters. Um, but he also gives us a solution. And I want to use the text today to give us three ways that we can live holy um, and live this thing out at, uh, as based on you know, biblical truth. And so the three points that we'll talk about today, the first is mindset of Christ, second is death to self, and then the third is clothed in the spirit. And as I, um, what I would tell my kiddos, I'm a school counselor and so I often teach classes. I say, if you're ready, say, oh yeah. So we're going to do mindset of Christ, set. So set is often used to convey, in the biblical context, um, placing of something, fixing something, or establishing something. And so it can imply that there's this intentional decision um, that we, or this intentional decision to orient our focus or our values or actions on a particular direction. So we're setting and in Paul's exhortation, when he says, set your minds and set your hearts in Colossians 3, he underlines the importance of us intentionally focusing on the values of God's kingdom. We're setting our minds, we're setting our hearts, our attention on Christ. Things of him, ways, purposes, his character, his plan. And Practically, when we think about how do we move towards holiness, how, do, how are we able to stay um, unstuck in our decision-making or those behaviors, the first step is gaining knowledge. The first step is setting our minds on Christ. In verse 10 of Colossians 3, it says, And have put on the new self, which is renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. To put on the new self, we have to be renewed in the knowledge of our creator, of God. 
And I think it's so interesting that we often don't take the time to sit with the person who created us. We're more focused on sitting with what he created, whether that's the world, uh, other people, or even our own personal, like ourself. And so if we are to live holy because he has called us holy, the first step is recognizing, hey, he created me. He is holy. If I'm holy, then that means I have to study. I have to learn who God is. Who is this creator? And we have all this knowledge of things that are going on in the world. And I, and I think back to um, game nights where we have like trivia and stuff like that we play. And there is a Bible version. I can't remember the game, but there's Bible trivia. And then there's like other trivia. I'm so ashamed because like the Bible trivia, I don't be knowing. I'm like, I didn't read numbers. Like, I'm pretty sure that's in that chapter. Um, But all this other knowledge, like I can quote movies. I can quote songs. But when it comes to quoting scripture, my tank is a little low, right? And so if we aren't putting our minds in this, if we're not studying the word, then we are going to be misled by the world. And... Psalm 119, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. And so the word can't just be in our hands. It can't just be up here either. It has to take that long journey to our hearts. Um, and we say often, you know, read your Bible every, every day, read your, right? And so that is great. I want you all to read your Bible, but it cannot stop there. We can't just read it, right? There's no comprehension when we are just reading something. And um, as I said, I'm a school counselor, and so I um, teach all grade levels, but this particular example um, were with my kindergartens, uh, kindergarten students, and we're in the hallway, and one of the kindergarten boys points to the sign, and he's like, Miss Stovall, what does that say? And it's the exit sign. And I say, because I'm such a great teacher, you tell me what it says. Um, sound it out. Um, and so he sounds it out. He gets it right. Exit. Yes, it's exit. And then he's like, what does that mean? And I'm thinking, you know, he was able to read the word. He saw the word, but there was no comprehension of what it meant. And particularly in this example, when we think about an exit sign, if there is danger or life, something life-threatening, they are not going to know what that sign means. It's not going to point them to safety. In the same way, we have to treat this as life or death. We have to know what is in the Word. We can't just read it. And that takes transforming the knowledge that we get in the book, right, what we read, into wisdom, Okay, so knowledge needs to be transformed into wisdom and wisdom is when we are able to apply that to our lives. Does that make sense, family? And so learning comes before living. And when we don't comprehend God's word, we don't understand God himself. And so that we can't pursue who he has called us to be as his creation and a misinformed Christian, y'all, I feel is just as dangerous as an unrevived sinner. Yeah. Like, we're both out here not being grounded and founded in the word. That's just as dangerous. We can be so misinformed. Um, and the world does that to us, right? And so, for example, we might hear, um, follow your heart. Follow your heart. You know, I want you to follow your heart, Brittany. Yeah, follow your heart. Do, do what you want to do right? But the word says that above all things, the heart is deceitful. We cannot follow our heart. We cannot follow our own happiness. It says that it leads us to life, to death. Our hearts lead us to death. It also says to follow Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. We can't follow our hearts. It also says, do what makes you happy. I have a shirt that says that, y'all. Do what makes you happy. It does feel good. 
you know? I teach career lessons for my, my elementary school students. I'm like, do what makes you happy. If you like building, be a carpenter, whatever, whatever, right? But does the word say that? No, we need to do what makes us holy, not happy. We cannot follow those things of our own, right? Um, I have a coworker, and I love her. And again, I moved to Richmond in July, and the transition's been really hard, but God has blessed me with a great coworker at work. If it wasn't for this woman, I would, well, it wasn't for a lot of things. I'll move back. Um, <laughs> But if it wasn't for this woman, I would have a worse time at work. Um, but I really, really love her. But she loves to gossip. She loves it. And I'm repenting. I didn't have not repented yet. Lord. I sometimes listen. And, yep. Mm-hmm. I, okay, I give into it. I give into it. I gossip with her. Um, and at times, you can just feel like we're just talking, right? It's not, it's not anything wrong with that or, or anything like that. Um, you know, she might even let a few, few cuss words slip, and people like, you know, cussing is nothing, nothing really wrong with that. Um, you know, when we get angry, we might, you know, flip someone off on the highway, you know, because they cut us off or whatever. You know, those things, those little things don't really mean a whole lot. But what does the Bible say? We even read it today. But now you must also rid yourselves of such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, gossip, and filthy language from your lips. We have been misinformed, family. And if we don't get the right knowledge and apply it, we will stay misinformed. We will stay living not in line with God's will. And so what is Paul really wanting us to understand here is that this mindset is in contrast with our mindset of the flesh is in contrast with our mindset of the spirit. And so those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the earth, our earthly desires, right? leading to spiritual death. But those who live according to the spirit sets our mind on things of God, leading to, leading to peace and freedom. Um, Joseph in the Bible, Jacob's son, is one of my favorite biblical characters. I feel like I really connect to him. And reading, going through this, um, preparing for this sermon today, it made me think about Joseph and when he was tempted um, by Potiphar's wife. And so Pot uh, Joseph was slave, uh, sold into slavery and he ended up in Potiphar's home as his servant. And then Potiphar's wife won a little something, something on the side. And so Joseph being handsome as he was, she was just basically like, here I am, Joseph. All this is yours if you would like it. And I think sometimes, <laughs> this is how I talk to myself, y'all. Um, and sometimes when I have read that, you know, I think that I, it doesn't, I don't pause to think of the struggle that Joseph had in that moment. You know, the, the word says what happened, then it just goes on through the next scene. Um, and sometimes we can think that Joseph in that moment has some super, you know, human power, right? No, he was human just like us. He is, he was human just like us. He did not have superhuman power. Um, but he said, no, he resisted. If there is chocolate cake in front of me, Brittany, and I'm not fasting, and, and it, look, it's free, <laughs> I'm going to eat the cake. I'm just saying, I'm going to eat the cake. Uh, but Joseph did not. He, he flew from temptation. Why or how? In the Bible, throughout the struggles that he had from um, his brothers to the pit, to the prison, he, it says that the Lord was with Joseph. Jacob, his father, poured the word and the love of God into him, and he was able to fix his mind on God. That is the only way that he was able to flee from Potiphar's wife. His mind was fixed. His heart was fixed on God. That, that, that is not easy to do. 
in our own human power, but when we have the supernatural power of the spirit, we can. We are empowered to live in victory when we are led by the spirit, when we have the spirit living in us. And that starts by cultivating the knowledge, the wisdom of God. So what does the play-by-play of your mind look or sound like? And what can you do differently today to ensure that your mind is set on the things above? The next is death to self. Death to self, point two. So Paul lists things that are consistent with the ways of the world and inconsistent with the new identities that we have in Christ. And so in verse five, he says, put to death all these things, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. And so I um, think about my own story with this. And like I said before, our life experiences, they influence our behaviors, they influence our sin patterns. And for me, at a very young age, I was exposed to sex. I was molested around five or six. I witnessed my mom and her involvement with men in our home. Um, Older cousins showing yellow cousins porn and and things like that. And so at a young age, I was exposed to those things. And so growing up, I did not know or recognize it wasn't told to me that that was against God, that we should not be led that way, right? Right. And so because of my experiences, I gave myself away at 16. I struggled with masturbation for a while. And these things influence my childhood, influence the way that I behave, my actions, the things that I crave, like your cravings change. You know, the desires of your heart change with some of the experiences that we go through. And that was a struggle for me. Those desires um, were were very present. I got saved at 19, gave myself to the Lord, thank you, Jesus, and rededicated my life to God and um, left those behaviors behind. Um, But yet and still, I still struggled after that. (laughs) Like, there was still temptation after that. Like, those things did not go away just because I invited Jesus into my heart, right? And so, you know, those struggles continued, and I reflected back, like, how or why did those things continue? I I was trying to pursue God, and I think a lot of times as new Christians, we believe that there's going to be an immediate switch, that my appetite is going to change once I become a Christian, and it, it doesn't happen that way. But what I was failing to do was dying to myself. I was not dying to those desires. I was not dying to those pleasures. And we are to live holy and set apart. We have to starve our flesh family. We can't keep feeding our flesh. We can't keep feeding our earthly desires. We have to starve it. Even when I think about um, like our physical bodies, right? The things that we eat are supposed to nourish our body, help us grow and, and whatnot. And so just as with our spiritual man, we have to feed that. We have to feed our spirit and starve our flesh. And we feed our spirit with the word, right? Um, and whatever we feed most is whether the flesh or the spirit, whatever we feed most, that's what's going to be in control. That is what's going to have the power. Um, And even a little bit of food can be really dangerous, especially when you're fasting, right? Um, So when I fast, I often, I take out soda and I take out sweets. And last year I fasted for 40 days, y'all. I did the Daniel for 40 days. I've never gone that long without soda. I've never gone that long without soda, but I did it. And then at day 41, I was like, I can do this. You know, lost a little weight and whatnot. (laughs) My face is clear, you know. I can keep this going on. And then I went to a restaurant and I didn't have to pay. (laughs) And you know, you ain't gotta get water if you ain't paying. (laughs) 
I got myself a Dr. Pepper, y'all. It was so good. Like the, uh, it was so good. And my little old self, oh, I'm gonna I'm stop drinking soda for the year. Nope. Mm. After that, I had a soda every day, okay? <laughs> Literally, every day. Um, and so even that, that, that one time, and I was set, y'all, I, I consider myself a disciplined person. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna continue to not drink soda. No, I had that one drink. And that's all it takes is that one time that one entrance to sin, that one um, foot, that one toe in it, right? That can lead us back down a path that we don't want to be in. Like we don't, we don't want to live in sin. We don't want to have these behaviors. And it only takes a little bit. And so dying to our flesh is essential for walking in holiness. And so when the enemy is, well, when we are presented with certain things, we have to have the discipline and the motivation to turn away. We have to. And so that takes a choice. It's a choice. And we have to make that choice minute by minute. Yes. Literally, yeah. minute by minute. It is a choice. So deciding to leave certain behaviors behind is a choice. You know, changing who you hang around, um, what you watch, what you read, what you listen to, what you, you know, the food you eat or what you drink. Like there are certain songs and beverages that I cannot have because my memory <laughs> will go back to that time. And even in our imaginations, you know, even in our imaginations that can feed our flesh. And so recognizing and becoming self-aware, what are those things for you all? What are those things that you know I can't even be in proximity of? Things that you know will get you back down that road that you have to turn away from, right? So what are those things for you all? And understanding that we have to set, right? We have to set our focus and set our, our mind on things above. In Ephesians 4, it says, with regard to our old life, we have put that off. We have put our, off our old self, which was corrupted by deceitful desires. Deceitful desires. And so what things are you all truly desiring, fam? And this is not a moment of, of shame or condemnation or anything like that. This is ve a very real reflection that I encourage you all to take into account. What are those things? What are those desires that you all have that needs to be put to death? And when that's put to death, we put on our new self. When we become children of God through faith in Christ, it's like putting on new clothes. And we can't wear our rags anymore, family. We can't wear those sinful garments anymore. I think about the woman with the issue of blood. And the Bible says that she bled for, for 12 years. Doctors weren't able to heal her. Um, and she was literally wearing blood-stained clothes all the time. And then she heard Jesus was in the area. And the hunger that she had to be healed, to see Jesus, led her to this crowd where she had to push her way through and just touch the hem of his garment. And she was immediately healed. Do you think this woman still wore blood-stained clothes? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. She probably burned all of her old clothes, okay? And started to wear new garments, the ones that Christ gave her. She was now free. She didn't have to wear those clothes anymore. And that's the same thing that we have to do in the spirit. God has set us free. When you have declared Christ as your savior and allow him to enter into your heart, you are free. You have already, God has already won the victory for us. And so you are currently right now, when you have declared Christ and you are worshiping him, you are free. He has already died for our sins. And some of us are still walking around in blood-stained, soiled clothes. We are walking around in our dirty rags that we don't have to anymore. 
And God is also saying, stop resurrecting old clothes that he don't put to death. Whether that's people or things that, he, that you all have already put to death, let it stay there. R.I.P. X. R.I.P. Whatever. Right? That has to stay dead. He wants us to continue to be revived in him. Someone say new life. New life. And so our new clothes are the things that are listed in the scripture that we read. It's being holy, clothing ourselves in tender-hearted mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, self-love, joy, the fruits of the spirit and forgiveness. God acts in these ways towards us and we need to act in these ways towards others. Jesus wrapped himself in flesh. Jesus wrapped himself in our dirty clothes. He came down, took off his royal robe, and came down and put on our blood-stained, soiled garments. And then he died and then gave us his royal robe. That is what we need to be wearing right now. Is that good news, family? Does that encourage us to put some things to death, to take off our old self and put on the royalty that Christ has given us? Yes. And it, and it takes a lot to continue to do that. But what I found even in my own walk, that it gets easier the more that I'm feeding my spirit. It gets easier the more I surround myself by like-minded people. It gets easier the more that I'm meditating on scripture, the more that I'm worshiping and listening to music. Um, if it wasn't for my, uh, my squad, my girlfriends who are in the room, like literally having Christian, close Christian relationships and friendships have saved my life. There are so many times where I wanted to give up or so many times that I wanted to stray or times when I did. And when I confessed to them, when I repented, it was encouragement that was returned back to me. It's people like that when you have them in your corner that keep pushing you towards Christ. They are reflecting God. And when we don't have that, or we're not setting our mind on the things that are above, it can be so much harder. And so from a practical standpoint, whenever I fall, like just uh, last month, I text my friend, hey, confession, colon, dot, dot, dot. This is what happened. Can you pray for me? It's hard to confess when we fall. And we want to maybe keep that close, keep it in the closet, right? But the Bible says we have to confess our sins. And if we don't confess, and you don't have to do it publicly. You don't. Find that one person that you can use and, and have that space with. The enemy loses its grip on us when we confess. He wants us to stay hidden. He wants our sins to stay in the dark. But when they are brought to light, it loosens the hold on us, family. So we have to create a heart and a posture and a habit of confessing our sins and being brought back into the repentance in, in, God's, in God's arms, right? So put on your royal robe. And when Christ ascended, you know, he gave us his robe. He ascended into heaven. He left us an advocate. And the last point is clothed in the spirit. We cannot fight this battle on our own. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The Holy Spirit is what we need in order to get this thing right and, and have it be consistent. We can't do an end of ourselves. Self-striving needs to die today. Self-striving is not spiritually beneficial for us. You all cannot, you cannot do it on your own. Absolutely not. We need God in order to pursue God. We need him in order to be more like him. And so when the spirit and the mind work in tandem, when they work together, 
it helps us change into our new nature. So when we have that knowledge of God, family, and we have that wisdom, and if we partner with the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, we are changed, and we continue to walk in that change. And the way that we act and our behaviors, we have to, it's like our neurons and those connections, they have to be rewired in our brain. And that happens through repeatedly doing that thing. Whatever those positive behaviors are, we have to do it over and over and over again. And the Holy Spirit is what helps us through that. The Holy Spirit empowers us. So when we meditate and when we shift and set our minds, we have transformed hearts. Our thoughts transform, our behaviors transform, and we are guided away from sin into holiness. It's the Holy Spirit that enables us to live the truth revealed to us through scripture. Society can't do that. Our family can't do that. The world should not inform how we live. The spirit needs to be our influencer. And my charge and prayer for us today is that we don't um, become discouraged. I think a lot of times when sin is talked about in church or is a focus point of a sermon, we can leave discouraged or even feel discouraged. And that is not my hope today. My hope is that the Holy Spirit convicts you as I've been convicted, but also understand that through conviction, there is victory. Like there is victory that we are currently and presently living in. And so don't lose hope, family. If, if you find yourself stuck in sin or stuck in behaviors that don't align with the Lord, don't lose hope. Keep doing your best. Keep living and trying to stay the course to that holy and acceptable life. As I was preparing and praying, like, God, what do you want um, your family to know? Above all the things that I prepare for, what, what is that, that point, that, that heart that you want them to know about you? And his words were, tell them to let me help them. Let me help. And it got the picture of a little kid who is, you know, too grown for their shoes or too grown for themselves. And they are wanting to put their own shoes on. Y'all have kids that want to do that. They don't know how to put the shoes on. It's on the wrong foot. They don't know how to tie the shoes yet. And they're like, no, let me do it. That's how we are with God. No, let me do it, God. I got it. He said, no, let me help you. Let me help you. He's saying that you can't do it on your own. Let me help you. You can't turn away from filthy language and cussing. Let me help you. He's saying that you can't stop that addiction on your own. Let me help you. You don't have the strength right now to leave that person's bed. Let me help you. You're, you're too focused on yourself and that pride. Let me help you. You're finding your identity in other things, in your career, in your spouse. Let me help you. Depression has held you for long enough. You don't have to do it on your own. Let me help you. You found your, your self-worth in other things of the world. Besides your worth in me, let me help you. You're not strong enough, daughter. You're not strong enough, son. And I'm right here. And the beautiful thing, family, is that he's not up there saying this. He comes right down. He kneels down in front of us like a little child. And he says that I am here for you. I don't care what you did. I don't care what your past has looked like. I don't even care what thoughts you have right now as I'm talking to you. I am right here with you. And I'm saying, let me help you. Your sins are not too big for me because they have already been put in the grave. You are living in victory because I have said so. And so he's wanting us to open our hands and put it away. And when we do that, we are able to grab his hands and rise with him. We don't have to carry our struggles anymore or those behaviors or our sin anymore. Father is saying that your clothes have gotten dirty. And that's okay. Let me help you. 
family, cling to the promises that are found in God's word. Leave the old behind. Begin identifying as the new creation that he has called you to. You are made new in him. And even through our struggles, he invites us to accept his grace, to accept that transformative power that comes through the Holy Spirit living within us. So lay down the weight, lay down the self-striving, put off those clothes, put off the, the, the hopelessness, the past failures, and allow God to help you. Can we rise to our feet? Father God, we thank you, Jesus, that even prophetically.